Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Rob Kret. I'm the, the executive director and CEO of the Connecticut Museum of Culture and History, and it's my pleasure to welcome you. I'm delighted that joining us today are guests from Connecticut Public's board and the Connecticut Museum's board, including President Sylvia Kelly. Uh, we also have with us Vice President Fiona uh, Fernal. We also have uh, Trustee Denise Merrill. Thank you for all, thank you for being with us tonight. When we think about slavery in the United States, we don't often think of the North. Tonight's conversation, Unforgetting, Restoring and Reclaiming Connecticut's Hidden Histories, will offer an illuminating conversation on slavery in our state. The Connecticut Museum is thrilled to be partnering with Connecticut Public this season to present engaging exhibitions, including Connecticut's bookshelf, spanning 300 years of print, culture, and we're game an exhibit that explores how sports can bring communities together. These thought-provoking exhibitions and programs like this broaden our understanding of Connecticut. Connecticut Public and the Connecticut Museum both play an important role in uncovering, researching, and informing the public about the state's past, present, and future. Tonight's a wonderful example of this collaboration at work. Now, if you're already a member of the Connecticut Museum, thank you. And if you're not, I encourage you to join so that you can uh, fully enjoy everything that the museum has to offer all year round. Don't miss the upcoming Woodward Lecture Series beginning on April 4th with a conversation on what makes a disaster by our state historian Andy Horowitz and the NYU associate professor Jacob A.C. Reams. Now I'd like to introduce and thank Lucy Nalpenthanchel, Vice President of Community Engagement at Connecticut Public. She's been planning this discussion along with Jamie O'Brien, our Chief Advancement Officer for the past few months. Again, thank you Lucy and your entire team at Connecticut Public for your dedication and ambition to telling whole history. Lucy. Thank you, Rob, for that wonderful introduction, and of course, to your whole staff at the Connecticut Museum of Culture and History, who have been great partners on this event. A special thanks especially to Eileen Frank as well, and Jamie O'Brien. What a great turnout. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I also want to give special thanks to the Wadsworth Athenaeum Museum of Art and the Amistad Center for Art and Culture for not only sponsoring tonight's event, but they also sponsored the series, the Connecticut Public Series, Unforgotten, Connecticut's Hidden History of Slavery. Now that whole series, if you didn't catch the stories, is at ctpublic.org slash unforgotten. Now I'm thrilled to introduce you to tonight's moderator, Diane Orson. Diane is special correspondent at Connecticut Public, which means she's really good at what she does. <laughs> Reporting and hosting conversations are second nature. Her journalism instincts launched the Unforgotten series, and she credits a team of journalists at Connecticut Public for the deep, impactful work they put into the series over nine months. Let's give Diane Orson a warm welcome. So, am I on? Can you hear me? Yeah, so thank you, Lucy, thanks, Robert, and thanks to all of you for coming out on this rainy March evening to attend our event tonight. Uh, before we meet our wonderful panelists, we're going to watch a video. It's a compilation of excerpts from five of the videos that are connected to the stories from the Unforgotten series. So we begin, we'll begin with that, and then we'll get into our conversation. So when I think about New England waterways and slavery, you know, you think about southern plantations and why enslaved people were brought in. And I think typically the thinking is people were just rounded up, put on boats and brought here. But really, people were rounded up and put on boats because they had certain skill sets. And so the waterways were really the area where that business took place. The enslaved were brought in, the rum was going out to Africa and to the Caribbean. So it truly was this triangular trade that we were absolutely a part of. 
And we tend to, again, think of the South as the center of that, but for a long time it was Newport, Rhode Island, and it was Bristol, Rhode Island. And so not only was New England complicit, New England was central to that slave trade. There was a Gradual Emancipation Act that was passed in 1784, but all that law really did was it said that the children born to the enslaved would be free after 25 years. Right? So it didn't say the s slavery could no longer be practiced in the state. It just said, you know, you would not be enslaved for life once you were born, you know, if you were born after 1784. Slavery didn't legally end in the state of Connecticut until 1848. Everything in school had always taught me that somehow I was like here by default. I mean, somehow black people were Americans, but you know, we were brought here and left here and, you know, there was that sort of a feeling. I never had the sense that not only were we here before there was an America, but that many of us fought for America's freedom before we, you know, had our own. You, you read about history, you read about American history, and you don't necessarily feel as connected because there's always going to be this asterisk. There's always going to be this notion that because you were owned, because you were imported, that your roots aren't really planted in, in this soil here. When you're able to look back at your lineage and understand that you think differently about patriotism and what it means to actually be a part of the fabric of this country, It's so cool to be able to play like history and what could be known as the first music ever written by a black composer who was in Connecticut. I think that when people imagine the past, they often imagine a past where we weren't there or we were just sort of operating in the background and doing the drudgery work, but I think that we were much more in the foreground and made many contributions that people have yet to know. It also informs the younger generations of specifically black string players that this legacy existed way before we even imagined. I'm not alone, but somebody else was in love with the violin. Because Shoni Freeman, he, he could have picked any other instrument, but he picked the violin. So it's important to know that people, even then, follow their passion when it was clearly not uh, the norm. I didn't have anyone in my family to pass down the history of quilt making, but I have family members that pass down photographs in, in our history. And so with Venture Smith's side of the family, which is on my paternal grandfather's side, um, I always wanted to make sure that the history would be passed down to my, my daughter and grandson too. And so quilt making, has been a um, positive reinforcement of telling the story, but telling the story sometimes that people don't want to hear. The images that are in the cloth make it easier to start conversations or have continuous conversations about family history and slavery in the United States and um, many other causes that affected pretty much um, black people living in the United States since slavery. I always say that Venture is like the beacon of hope for anyone else looking for their family history. There are so many people that are descendant of slaves in the United States that don't have the history to go back to. And so when I talk about Venture and all that he's done, I'm also like giving hope for other people. I just look as vent at Venture as his story is um, an amazing story for other people to learn from and to start digging and finding their own family history. 
I heard stories of exceptionalists from an African-American perspective. And there was a, like a handful of them, like I could tell you, the Martin Luther Kings, the, the Rosa Parks, the Harriet Tubmans, like there's a couple, a few here and there. But I didn't, I considered those the one in a millions. Like I, I didn't get the million side of the story. And when I started learning about my own ancestors, like my own great, great grandfather, his name was Ned Mills. He was enslaved in Texas. He was freed on Juneteenth. When I started learning about his life and his story, I realized he was the common story. I didn't know a lot about the common story. When the Stones Project is an educational project where we work with teachers and students to restore the history and honor the humanity of enslaved individuals who helped build our communities. And we do it through research, education, and civic engagement. And we go to town to town and work with communities, historical societies, churches to help tell the story. A friend of mine, he went to Germany, did some work with folks who were doing um, restorative and reparation work, and came back and said, could we remember enslaved people the way the Germans remembered Jews who were kidnapped and murdered during the Holocaust? And he showed me what a memorial looks like. And, and that kind of clicked in my head that if the final thing is to put a memorial in the ground, what do we have to do beforehand? Probably within two weeks, the information fell into place in my head to say, now I know how I can bring this information into my eighth grade classroom. Welcome to this Witness Stones installation ceremony to honor the life and contributions of Tommy, a man who was enslaved here at the Deacon John Grave House. I was a little bit scared because learning about hard history is difficult and learning what people went through in this time and how terrible it was for Tommy. And, but as I started researching, I just wanted to learn more and more and more. And it was like, it was hard to learn about him, but it was good in the end. He was just treated like an animal. And by doing this, we are really just telling people that he was a person. I, I grew up in Massachusetts saying, slavery was in the South, racism was in the South, segregation was in the South, the South needs to fix it. What happens if it was here, and racism's here, and segregation's here? Then maybe our kids will do a better job fixing it than we have. So as we get settled, um, okay, you can take a seat. Um, let me just explain for those of you who haven't seen the series that the Unforgotten series is made up of five stories. Um, the first is uh, kind of an overview uh, in the time that we have, just scratching the surface, uh, with hi historians talking about and setting up this, this story of enslavement in Connecticut. The center three stories, each story uh, focuses on an individual or a family that were enslaved. One of them, it was an enslaved musician whose music that you heard briefly as uh, in this um, video and you heard as you came in. That was that composer's music. Um, and then the final episode is with young people who are learning this history and um, talking about how what happened then matters now. Uh, so that's an overview. You can learn more uh, about that series by going to ctpublic.org slash unforgotten. Anyway, I am so pleased to be joined by our three panelists. Um, right to my left is Akia Devaros Gomes, Senior Curator of Maritime Social Histories at the Mystic Seaport Museum. She's curator of a forthcoming exhibition, which is called Entwined, Freedom, Sovereignty, and the Sea. This is Pat Wilson Phineas. <clears throat> she's a former Connecticut State Representative, and she's featured in, as is Akia, in the uh, in the in the Unforgotten series. Um, and Yale award-winning Pulitzer Prize-winning historian, educator, and author David Blight. His recently published book is called Yale and Slavery. So let me begin by saying that all of us are storytellers. I mean, we all have stories. We tell stories. We share stories. We also share history. And this evening, I'm hoping we can explore some of this shared history. Pat, Akia, David, and I will begin by speaking together. And then around 720-ish, 725-ish, we will 
uh, have time for your questions. So uh, there will be time for you to engage with our panelists. For a very long time, many of us, not all, but many of us, have thought of historical slavery in the US as a Southern thing. I mean, when we think of slavery in the US, very few of us imagine in our minds Connecticut or New England, even though this is where we live. So why is that? Enslavement was a driver of the economy in early New England and early Connecticut. Enslaved people lived and worked all over the state. And for many of us, that part of our shared history is just starting to make its way into the foreground of our understanding of who we are as a people in this state. I feel like there's a kind of reawakening, a recalibration that seems to be underway, and it's happening around Connecticut in many different ways, in schools, in museums, in churches, on town greens, in coastal wildlife management areas, and I think it comes at a time when reflection and engagement with the past seem critical to confronting the challenges that we face right now, today. So in February, we saw the release of, of the book Yale and Slavery. In March, the launch of the Unforgotten series. And in April, a major exhibition will open at the Mystic Seaport Museum. And we're going to begin by talking a little bit about these projects and what they mean for our shared Connecticut story. So let's begin chronologically in terms of the order of when they were released this year. So David Blight, it's such a pleasure to have you here. Thanks so much for being here. You've um, been a scholar of the Civil War for decades and a director of the Gilder Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition at Yale. Why this book? Why now? OK, thank you. Uh, thank you, Diane, my colleagues here, Key and Pat. And Lucy, I, first of all, it's a thrill to be in the presence of all these NPR voices I live with. <laughs> uh, although I've done events with Diane before, but anyway, I can tell people I, I met NPR voices. Anyway, uh, well, the short version is uh, this book about Yale's entanglements with slavery has a fairly long evolution through various episodes and events at Yale, um, at least it goes back to 2001 when there were three graduate students at Yale who did a study uh, of how the Yale residential colleges were named and for whom they were named and discovered, uh, which was a revelation for most people, uh, that uh, about eight or nine of them had been slaveholders, all sorts of famous people uh, like Jonathan Edwards. Etc. Uh, that report uh, caused a stir at the time, a stir for official Yale at the time. Um, and then a lot of other things have happened since then in our world, as most people in this room know. Also, universities started studying slavery in their past. Brown was one of the first, although UVA, Virginia, was there sort of at the origin of this as well. It's about a 20-year a little over a 20-year process now, that many major universities, and now even a lot of small colleges, uh, are studying their past, uh, not just about slavery, but about a lot of things. Uh, there's now over 80, uh, there may be over 90 by now, uh, universities in a group called Universities Studying Slavery. Uh, Yale is late to this in terms of our actual formal uh, study and product, Turns out there are some advantages in going late, because uh, <laughs> you learn from your colleagues. And in fact, one of the first webinars we did, we, we launched this in the fall of 2020. Everybody here remembers 2020. Depth of the pandemic, uh, only months after the George Floyd events, the entire summer of protests, Black Lives Matter, et cetera, et cetera. That is a context in which Peter Salovey, the president of Yale, called me one day in September and said, uh, would you consider managing, researching, and writing a report on Yale and slavery? And I mean, the truth is, for about 30 seconds or a minute on the phone, I was praying he would not ask me to do that, because I had just started working on a new book. I had Frederick Douglass behind me, and I had just launched this research effort on James Weldon Johnson, which was my next book. And here he is asking me to 
give up the next three years of my life for this. I didn't know how many years it would be. But anyway, long story short, um, I said yes. Uh, and my center, the Gilder Arman Center, managed this project. And so did the president's office. And it must be said, and I say this at every event I do, Peter Salovey owned this. He wanted this done. Uh, and his office not only supported this, they didn't pay me or any of the faculty involved anything, but they paid our research assistants. And without them, and without a working group of faculty and local public historians, we could never have done this. Um, but the, the why question is not just because, the, the why answer, Diane, is not just because a lot of other universities have started doing this. And I had been involved with Brown for years. I mean, we, we did a joint conference together, uh, uh, Brown and Yale. We did a conference on, on the idea of repair in the world back in like 2006. So we'd been, in, and we've had working groups and study groups at my center on the problem of modern slavery and how, how to remember slavery. But I'd never really wanted to study Yale. That wasn't my subject. But oh my God was there a lot to learn. And probably, I, I, I can't give a precise percentage, but the vast majority of our sources, our evidence, come right from within the Yale libraries. And Yale, as many of you probably know, has magnificent archives. Magnificent archives. Uh, I, I like to say that because I try to spend every hour I can in those libraries. Um, <laughs> But it has a moment now, too, born of the teens, born of this era of Trumpism, born of this era of so much turmoil over all things Confederate, Confederate monuments. Uh, there's a certain bookend to this era we're living, although many things were happening before, that begins with Charleston, the massacre in Charleston at Mother Manual AME. Now there had been police shootings of all kinds before then. But after that, a lot of things changed about how institutions were asking questions about themselves, were looking at towns, were looking at whatever their monuments were, when were they put up and by whom, uh, whether they were about the Confederacy or not. Uh, whole cities launched, you know, studies of their monument landscape, as New York City did, and learned all kinds of things that might have wished it hadn't learned, but now it, glad it did, or whatever it is. Um, but then the doing of this book, uh, I'll say just a word about it and then turn it over to my colleagues. It has been many different kinds of lessons for me as a scholar. One of the big questions is, in this project, is how much is this going to be about Yale? And it had to be. But how much of it is about Connecticut and New England? And then thirdly, how much of it is about the black community of New Haven, which has always been there, and it grew slowly but surely throughout the 18th century into the 19th century. So we had a kind of a three, I say we because this was a group effort. I'm the principal author, but a lot of people worked on this. We had a kind of a three-pronged approach to this. What's happening at Yale? And to and by Yale people. And there's a lot of famous Yale people in this book. And I haven't heard from any of their descendants yet. <laughs> the second story was the region and the nation and Yale's relationship and Yale's entanglements with slavery and that relationship, and, that, and also to the world. And we were talking earlier, 50% of all commerce out of New Haven Harbor alone in the 18th century went to the West Indies, went to the sugar nexus, the great plantation, the sugar economy of the West Indies. Huge parts of Connecticut's economy depended on slavery and the slave trade with the West Indies. And then lastly, we made a determination, we're gonna look as deeply as we can at the black community of New Haven, which always lived next to, with, because of, 
uh, in spite of <laughs> Yale College and Yale University in its midst. And we tried the best we could to keep all three of those stories going literally in every chapter. Um, and then the last point I'll make is I learned a lot in doing this book about many things. I learned a lot about all those names I'm building from all over that campus. But I mostly learned something about making judgments. How we make judgments about the past. That's not as simple as it sometimes seems. This is evil and that's good. That's wrong. I mean, you can make in your mind a list of, eh, pretty good people, not quite so good people, and horrible people. <laughs> horrible. horrible people. And I have my list about historical Yaleys, but I don't, you can't write good history that way. That's not history. That's list making. That's trying to settle scores in the past by your judgments now. So the test of doing something like this about your own institute, and by the way, I didn't go to Yale. I don't have any degrees from Yale. I don't, I don't have anything to do with one of those residential colleges and you know, form my lifetime identity around it like some people do. That wasn't my problem. I don't have that problem. I'm a state university guy from Michigan State and Wisconsin. I don't, I, don't, I don't know from the Ivy League, except I just work here. But, you know, the 18th century was a different place. And the 19th century was a different place. Doesn't mean we apologize for them. In fact, we don't. We try to understand how this much racism, this much brutality, this much humiliation could be practiced by such incredibly educated people. But it's the same questions we ask about ourselves today, isn't it? How can we be, we be so smart today? And we have all the smartness in our pockets. We have the world in our pocket. How can we be so smart and still not solve all these problems? I'm gonna jump in and ask you, before we go to Pat, hmm. we were talking earlier about uh, one of the people mentioned in the book, and the book, by the way, is great. I highly recommend it. Um, Uriah Parmalee. Mm. Can you tell us a little bit of a story of Uriah Parmalee? And the reason this I is your ask, cue, Pat. <laughs> the reason I ask at the, is that there is a connection between this student from Yale and which I just learned about and oh. Pat's ancestors. I got to rewrite that part of the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, very briefly. Uh, there's a war memorial at Yale. If any of you have ever walked through Woolsey Hall at Yale, you've walked right by it. In fact, people who are at Yale walk by this every day. Students have walked by it hundreds if not thousands of times, right on the way to the dining hall, I think, after all. It's an extraordinarily well-crafted, aesthetically war mon monument to the Yale dead in the Civil War. I can come back to that in a few minutes because in some ways it's one of the most poignant stories in the book. Mm -hmm. But one of the names on there, one of the Yale men who died fighting for the Union is Uriah Parmalee, who grew up out in Guildford, was a junior at Yale in the spring of 1861, uh, full of fury that when secession happened, he was gonna enlist and go to war. And by means I've never fully figured out, although there, there's a little bit of writing on him now. Uh, he was an abolitionist at the tender age of 20. And he might have gotten it from his church in Guildford. He might have gotten it some other ways. He was a complicated abolitionist. Uh, but he thought the war was all about slavery. He's a white kid from a farm outside of Guildford. And he, he joined up first in the New York regiment because there wasn't a Connecticut one to, to join yet. He later becomes a member of a Connecticut cavalry unit. Again, a long story made short, he left hundreds of letters. He also kept a diary at the front. Uh, he was in virtually every major campaign of the Eastern Front of the Civil War. If you know your Civil War, that's a lot of horror. He had two horses shot out from under him, but he never got shot. And in the very last campaign of the war, his unit 
is going down through Virginia, the mostly western part of Virginia. They go through Charlottesville. The kid had a sense of history. Uh, he knows he wants to go see Monticello when they're going by Charlottesville. Um, he, oh, he gave his copy of his collected Shakespeare to a comrade, and the guy lost it. He, he's, he can't stop talking about how depressed he is that he lost his Shakespeare. I mean, I imagine that's probably how he kept himself sane. After the fall of Richmond, uh, Lee's army begins to retreat westward. And in the last major engagement of the war, at Five Forks, uh, Parmalee was hit in, hit in the chest with a cannonball and killed on the spot. The last major engagement of the war. Um, I start every course I do on the Civil War Reconstruction by telling the students about that story. And I all but order them to walk, you know, because they're leaving my lecture hall to walk right through that corridor again to go and go get lunch. And I say, you go find Uriah, you know. And, and then I tell them, but he was an exception. There weren't that many staunch abolitionists from Connecticut in the Army. Some of them became that way because of the war, but they didn't necessarily enter that way. Uh, I've just learned that, well, you tell it. Your ancestors. You're up. <laughs> may have been related to... That sort of I mean. jumps in about a hundred years after the start of the story. No, I know. <laughs> well, take it back further. Why not? But I will. So the story of my <clears throat> family um, began in, well, or at least in America, began in 1727 when a merchant, um, uh, a Scottish merchant named David Naughty, imported two teenagers, um, uh, two 17-year-olds, and the word imported always seemed a bit odd to me, but it turns out that's how he avoided paying taxes, <laughs> was by bringing them into Boston and then taking them from there to Guilford. At any rate, these, uh, he was a, a childless man, and he brought these two teenagers uh, to his, his home in Guilford. They lived on the green. Um, over the next 25 years, these two became a couple, and they had eight children in that house, all of them right in that house on the green in Guilford. Um, the Naughty died about 10 years after bringing Montrose and Phillips, who the original um, the two enslaved people. And in the, when he died, he left a will. In that will, he planned to free Montrose, Phillips, and any children that they had. But he decided he would free, and he also left them some property, some small house in, on, in Nut Plains and some other things. But the will was not to take effect until the death of his wife. And unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately for her, but unfortunately for us, she lived another 30 years. During that 30 years, she indentured, rather than um, at, at the time when she died, well, let me say, before she died, when each of the children reached age 20, they were indentured out to a local family. And they you know, were served as servants. They sometimes learned to trade or did other things. But they were all to uh, families within several blocks of each other. So in many ways, the family was able to remain in the same town generally and together. But they um, each were indentured out. Of the eight children, there were two early deaths, two children named Caesar. But as I said before, out of eight children, they had only one single grandchild. And that grandchild was to their eldest daughter, Flora. Um, she, when she was indentured out at age 20, she somehow connected to a young man by the name of uh, Sharper Rogers, who subsequently was a, fought as a freedman in the Revolutionary War. Together, they fathered Caesar, um, the sole grandchild. And from that sole grandchild, every other buddy else in my family came from that, from that one individual. Now, as I said, each of these children was indentured out. Getting back to, to, to Candace, she was the youngest daughter, and she was born in 1751 and died in 1826. But she was indentured during that time to the Parmalee family, who is uh, owned 
Highland House, or the, the, the building Highland House, which is now a museum, was originally the family home. And when she was a young, you know, probably about 22, um, she went to live in the Parmalee household. And about maybe a year or so after she was indentured to the Parmalee, Mrs. Naughty finally died. And when she did, instead of the children getting their freedom, they were essentially indentured for life or willed to the families with whom they were living. Now, in her will, interestingly, she lays out why she did this. She felt that it would be better for them to be living with Christian families than simply to be you know, free and to live a free life. And she even indicated that she consulted with them about this. It, it, so it says in the will, I wonder what sort of consultation that was. But nonetheless, she um, did that. And she also bequeathed to each of the, each of the children her worldly goods. I mean, I, I was always sort of impressed. I mean, you, you, in those days, of course, women were, white women, were just a little better off than enslaved people, not, not a whole lot better. I mean, women were discriminated against, generally speaking. And so she, the, the terms of her husband's will was that she would inherit all of these things if she never married anybody. But if she married anybody, all she got was a silver cup. Oh, the silver cup for the church, and I think. So, but at any rate, there, she clearly had to stay unmarried. And, but the, all of her worldly goods, essentially, she bequeathed to these various enslaved, um, enslaved people. I was always rather impressed by that. When you read the will closely, you begin to see it's like she was giving, letting each of these enslaved people set up their own household. That was her intent. But the Parmalee piece was that this must have been his grandson or yeah. great grandson. So it was, it was. Because uh, Candace died in, in, like I said, in um, 1826. Yeah. And so that was significantly before. I just um, want to jump in. And, I'm going to jump in for a second, excuse please. me, and just say that the Highland House Museum, where Candace was enslaved in Guilford, is a place you can all visit. Mm -hmm. It's quite extraordinary to go there. And if you go up to the, um, the I think it's the, the third, third floor, floor. Mm -hmm. you actually see the room where Candace lived. Mm -hmm. and, and it was the, an unheated attic where she lived. But it's, it's quite extraordinary to, to go there. So um, I'd recommend that. Um, I want to ask you, Pat, sure. um, how you learned about your ancestry and what, what that's meant to you, well, finding your family. Well, and it, it really also is the story of the Whitney Stones program, because the, before there was a Whitney Stones program, there was a Dennis Culloden and a Douglas Nygren who began this research. And Dennis Culloden um, is the one who was, at that time, a middle school history teacher, a middle school, um, Adams Middle School. And he was reading some old text. He was doing some work on old Guilford. And he read an old Lyman uh, Beecher biography, I believe, and it referenced some enslaved people. And he hadn't known that there were enslaved people back then. And so he began doing the painful research to, to go through these multiple sources, because this history is not easy to dig out. You have to go here and there and find you know. And so Dennis began doing this work of tracing who were these people that were referenced in Lyman Beecher's um, autobiography. Eventually, he uncovered. The, he went back to Manchus and Phyllis, uncovered the eight children, uncovered the family, took that one grandchild that I spoke of, Caesar, traced him, and like I said, there was only one grandchild, traced him all the way till he ran into an obituary of a Tuskegee Airman, um, Lieutenant Colonel Bertram Wilson, who was my father. And so th this was some 16 years after Daddy had died, and uh, the first obituary Dennis found didn't really have any reference to family. But about a year later, he found a locally, probably the Hartford Current or one of the New London papers, and it mentioned at that at that time, which would have been some I don't know, 12 or 16 years before then, that I was then the commissioner of social services, that one of the airmen's daughters was still living, and so I got a call, quite out of the blue, um, I got a call from this middle school teacher who had at least five generations of history that I knew nothing about because he had traced these people. From the from the you know the child of the enslaved couple all the way through my father and then of course he found me and my son Cheo Hodari Coker and his family and now we we have eleven generations of history um, because of Dennis's work and my family story in many ways became the became the sort of the seminal project for um, the Witness Stones 
Now, now we have placed them, I am, by the way, the, um, the chair, board chair of the Witness Stones Project. And when the project was founded by um, Dennis and, and some others, we, we've been working at this since. So now we've laid some 200 or more family, members of many people's family. But for those in Guilford, some four or five of them are my family. And so because of the in-depth research that Dennis Cullinan um, did before the Witness Stones program was founded, we were sort of like the Adam and Eve story mm -hmm. of the program. Mm -hmm. But now there have been more than 200 um, stones laid and we are now in five states. So not just in Connecticut, but also in Rhode Island, Massachusetts, New York, um, and I'm forgetting somebody. New Jersey. Right. New Jersey. Right. Yes. Okay. And, and stretching out e even further. Well, I'll come back to you in just a moment. Mm -hmm. I want to turn to Akia, okay. and, and then I do want to come back. Sure. Akia, um, talk to us about the exhibition that's about to open at the Mystic Seaport Museum. Well, I was thinking about it when you mentioned attic spaces the woman who was enslaved and lived in the attic space. So the central, I'm kind of going backwards, right? But the central part of the exhibit is actually a reproduction of an attic space. Because I don't think a lot of people realize in these beautiful colonial New England homes, a lot of enslaved and indentured people were forced to live in attic spaces mm -hmm. in the heat of the summer, right? Or in the cold of the winter. I just had to go up in my attic to get a suitcase for today. And I just wanted to be in and out of there, right? Because it was so bitter cold. Um, but that's a very small part of the story we're telling. You know, ironically, I'm sitting here and very little of what we're doing in Entwined actually focuses on slavery. Um, it's part of a larger project through Brown, it's funded by the Mellon Foundation, but it's a collaborative project with Brown University and Williams College. And it's a project that seeks to understand New England as the site of colonialism, slavery, and dispossession. And when I was asked to curate the exhibit, my first thought was, I don't want to do an exhibit about that. But it's because I feel like black and indigenous histories are so much more than that, right? And so can we talk about enslavement as the context for some of our stories, but not our story? Mm -hmm. And so moving beyond, like it's really important to understand that slavery happened here. It's really important to understand the system that keeps it going. Right, so it's no longer here in our face, but it's in other places in the world. And it's part of that same system. Um, but where's the joy in telling that story? And where's the kin and community in telling that story? And so from the beginning, Entwined has been about communities that are here now. And me going to those communities and saying, what is your maritime story? So before I even started, before I even had a concept of what the exhibit was gonna look like, we put together a committee, and all of the committee members, except for one, and some of you will giggle when I say this, um, except for Jason Mancini, everyone else on the committee is black or indigenous. And so we sat down and we had a conversation. What is the story we want to tell? Um, because as soon as you say we're doing an, an exhibit on black and indigenous maritime history, everyone's like, oh, whaling, right? And, and that's not the story we wanted to tell. So there were a couple, of, a couple of primary narratives that came out of conversations with the committee. The first was, again, why would we focus on slavery, colonialism, and dispossession as our New England story? The second was, if we are truly gonna tell these stories from black and indigenous perspectives, validating black and indigenous worldviews, you don't talk about the ocean or rivers or waterways without talking about spirituality and ancestors. So that, was a, that is a central component to our exhibit. We are telling, and I say we, not as the curator at Mystic Seaport Museum, I say we as a person of African descent because I'm sharing my stories and my perspective in that way as well. And so we decided we wanted to tell stories, we wanted to tell a history that our ancestors would want us to tell. And so then what does that story become and what is valued and what is seen as important and what is seen as not so important. And so the exhibit is really about 12,000 plus years of maritime history. Um, and how that 12,000 years of adaptation and kin and community and innovation and ecological knowledge helped us survive 
what in the scope of that history is this very brief cycle of colonialism, slavery, and dispossession. And I say cycle because again, in validating in, two separate words, in, validating <laughs> um, African and indigenous perspectives, time is circular and cyclical and everything is about birth, life, death, and rebirth. And how do we tell the story of our existence and our histories through that framework? So then it becomes about trauma, but then there's healing. Death, but then there's rebirth, right? Sadness, but then there's joy. And so it's an exhibit that talks about all of those things, focuses on that moment of encounter when Africans encountered indigenous people here in the Dawnland. And we use the Dawnland instead of New England because think about what New England means, right? The indigenous people were supposed to go away and England was supposed to be recreated in this place. So we're using the indigenous term Dawnland. What was that connection like? What was that encounter like? What was it like when African descended people saw similarities in the way they saw the world and their spirituality and the way they honored their ancestors? They saw indigenous people here with the same worldview. Right? How incredible must that have been? Um, so the first part of the exhibit is that 12,000 years of history and that encounter. There's the attic space. And in the attic space, the, the original idea was to recreate the attic of a place called the Wanton Lyman Hazard House in Newport, Rhode Island. It's the oldest standing um, home that still exists in Newport. And I'm from Newport. I still live in Newport. Um, my first grown-up apartment was right behind this house, and I did not realize the significance. But in 2005, some work was being done in the attic space, where we know the names of at least four enslaved people had to live, and a floorboard was pulled up, and these pieces of cloth, and nails, and shells, and animal bones, and buttons, and broken glass were found. And luckily, the person who found them knew what they were. Because I suspect things like that have been found before, but they've been believed to be garbage, right, and, and just cleaned up. But what we know is that those were a bundle, um, what, what I would call an Nkisi bundle. So if you've ever seen those figures, um, and, and they're all over sub-Saharan Africa, right? Um, they're figures, and sometimes they're human, sometimes they're in animal form, but embedded in them are cowrie shells, and sometimes broken glass, and sometimes twine and cloth. And the way that you, and, and so in, in the African mind, there is a single god or a single creator. But that creator is so busy creating that if you want to ask for something, you go to your ancestors. You don't go right to the creator, right? And so these Nkisi figures are what you use for your prayers. You hit them or you strike them with a nail to breathe life into your prayer. And so all of the things that were in this cloth bundle, I mean, think of that as, as what a creative adaptation. You can't create that sculpture. You can't have that figure in your attic space. But you can create a bundle that reminds you of home and reminds you of your family and reminds you that you're human and reminds you of your ancestors. So that's in the very center of the exhibit. Um, we also have a copy of the Eliot Bible in the exhibit which was a Bible that was used to Christianize indigenous people here. But that's not the story we're telling with the Bible. The story we are telling is that 300 plus years after that Bible was translated by a Nipmuc man, by the way, into Algonquin language, and then printed by that same Nipmuc man, um, 300 plus years after that, that very Bible was used to reclaim and regain indigenous languages. Right, and so the entire exhibit is really about that reclaiming, our reclaiming of oceans and waterways and history and storytelling is history. And so when you walk out of that space, it's all contemporary black and indigenous art that is in honor of ancestors and tells those stories. I can't believe how fast time is flying. I have about 25 questions and we're not gonna get any <laughs> near We'll have them. to do a part two. Yeah. Okay. Um, Please. Please. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Please, go ahead. I want to make the connection because um, when I found my family, that connection that you're talking about, almost between the ancestors and, and the present, was made for me. Mm. And that was a very precious experience. That's what, that's, you asked me about the essence of what I got right. from finding out this history. Right. 
And it was a connection that hadn't been there before, because as my son said in, in the video, it's almost like, we, you know, black people are here, somehow we're here, but, but you know, there's always been that, that not quite connectedness to it. And so finding that history back to a time before there was in America gave me a connection, not just, you know, I felt an immediate connection to those people. That's how the poem Grandma Flora came about, because it was, I could now see and feel my connections back. And I knew that America was indeed mine. I didn't have to be gifted it. I didn't have to be um, connected to it. I was it. And that, that, that understanding is what I want for every child, for every black child, but every white child too. I want all of us to understand what America is to us and that we all, we, we all own it. We all, all own her. It is, you know, she is a part of all of us. But so many of us are cut off from that and, and, and cut out. And it is that ancestral connection that you referenced, I mean, in a slightly different way, but it's still very much there. I feel, I felt walking through that house in, in Guilford, I felt her, you know? And I, I, that makes me happy, that, makes, that gives me joy, that gives me strength, it makes me feel as though they've always been there, and I've always been riding on that love, on that connectedness. And it, I would never have had that had it not been for the work of Dennis and, and others who dug that out and, and gave it to me. You know. Well, we have five minutes before <laughs> we're going to open up questions. But I, I just want to ask, um, where do we, how do we not forget this story? I mean, it feels like, I know I, I was saying, I'm also from Rhode Island and my brother here. <laughs> we grew up in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, went to Samuel Slater Junior High School and knew nothing about this. So what I want to know is, here we are now, and in just a few minutes, I'd like to hear from each of you, what, how do we not forget this again? For me, if I can jump in there, it's easy, it's the children. You know, the, you know when we teach our children, when we help children understand this history and own this history and love this history, they grow differently. I see it all the time when we interact with children in the Whitney Stones program. Now, I, I don't do the work of teaching that I leave to more expert people. I show up and give a speech at the end <laughs> or talk about, talk about you know, my experiences. But what I'm always moved by is how this program changes the way children accept and look at, them, look at things and the in-depth sense of compassion and honesty with which they approach this work. And I don't think they will forget. I don't think they can look at things the same as they did before. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, it, you, when you take a phrase like Black Lives Matter that gets you know, thrown, around, thrown about, and when you understand where it came from, that it is a cry because black lives have so often not mattered, that it's a declaratory statement not a, you know, and that it, these children, when they had this full sense of history, how we were animalized, how we were dehumanized, how we were held back and pushed back and kept down, they understand that in the context of what's happening now. And it's not foreign. Mm -hmm. And it won't be forgotten, I don't believe. David? Uh, public history, public history, public <laughs> history. <laughs> Uh, is my answer, if, if I have to have one answer. Uh, look, we, we, could, we, could, we could mention a number of other examples of huge pieces of the past that were not studied much or shoved aside or embarrassing to some kind of national narrative, uh, but yet found a historical moment when boom, the society, something was happening in the society that made people ask, oh my God, where'd this come from? Think about emancipation, think about the civil rights movement, think about, my God, lately, we just had an education on section three of the 14th Amendment. How many of you even knew there was a section three of the 14th Amendment? I was on TV talking about, I couldn't believe, section three, all right. We may not forget that now either. But, but last point, you know, scholars have been studying race and slavery in New England for a very long time. 
Lorenzo Green wrote a book on this. 60, give me the date again. 1939, I was gonna say 60 years, I'm way off. And then Joanne Mellish about a dozen years ago, it yeah. probably means it's 15 years ago. 20 something. 20 some years ago, every, every time I say 10, it means it's 20 now. But, and, and you know, but th there's, always, there's a process of how scholarly history, and even what we may be teaching in universities in particular, gets into the public realm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've, I've been doing you know, public history now about as long as I can remember, but I never was trained to do it. You're not necessarily trained to do it when, when you go do a PhD somewhere. But if this becomes, maybe slowly but surely, but this isn't so slow right now, a major part of the historical identity of Connecticut, Massachusetts, the rest of New England, uh, for that matter, you know, something like Yale, um, it has ways of sticking, mm -hmm. especially if you build it into tours and you build it into museum exhibitions. Let's face it, folks, museum exhibitions are the most popular way Americans learn history. They're not reading all of our books. They should be, but they're not. They're going to exhibitions, and you, you know this. Uh, they own a historic sites. And they go there with things in their heads. They, they want a nice story for the family for a morning, or they want a pleasing narrative that they can live in. But they're also capable of understanding that human beings are really flawed, and sometimes really tragic, and sometimes really horrible to each other, because uh, they live in that world every day. So people are capable. I'm mean, not everybody. <laughs> but most people are capable of a, of a little rise in their historical consciousness if, if we're you know, talented enough to bring it to them. And there, there's a revolution going on in public history about these issues all over the country. Of course, it takes resources, <laughs> you know. It, it takes commitment, it takes money. It takes people. And by the way, I got, I got two names in here off emails who really know that Parmalee family well. <laughs> They're in the same footnotes that, that Dennis is in in, 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 in a chapter in here. We'll, we'll look for that. So they, those people may, you may want to talk to them. I, I just want to get your take on this, Kia, before sure. we jump to questions. I mean, I think my answer will probably be short and sweet, right? You started this whole thing by saying we're all storytellers. You got to keep being storytellers. So I, I think like a lot of people in this room probably grew up with a mother or grandmother that told us stories and we didn't care, right? Oh, we yeah. just wanted to go out and play. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and now I, I think that's why I became an, an academic and an anthropologist because I was trying to recapture all of those stories I ignored. But not just telling stories and listening to stories, but validating stories. So if someone tells a story that they are telling as a history and it contradicts your worldview, yeah. validate it and listen to it anyway. If someone tell, you know, I, yeah. I often, when I do presentations, tell the story of Evo Landing yeah, yeah. And, and how Evo Landing and when <coughs> enslaved people jumped off ships during the Middle Passage, we frame it as a suicide because in our Western mind, that's what it is. But in the African worldview, Going underwater is going home, and going underwater is going to your ancestors. Why don't we tell the story that way? That's black history, right? And, and passing those stories on is black history. And I will end on this note because it's cute and it makes people giggle. <laughs> I'm already Because I, I, think, I think even when, you know, this is a thing that's frustrating for me as a scholar, but gives me a lot of comfort as a black woman and as a woman of Cape Verdean descent. When I was younger, we grew up next to a cemetery, and we would always play in the cemetery. And you know, I remember my mother saying when she would play in that cemetery and go running out, her grandfather would say, run in the zigzag. It would never explain it. It would just say, run in the zigzag. That's what he'd yell to the kids as they ran out. And without being told to do that, probably seeing my older cousins do that, I ran in a zigzag when I played in that cemetery. When my son was a toddler and I brought him to play in that cemetery, I would have him chase me and I ran in a zigzag, not even thinking about it, right? 
First time I was in Cape Verde, 100 years to the day my great-grandfather came to New Bedford, we stopped at a cemetery, and the person driving the car kind of chuckled and said, you know when we go in there, you have to run in a zigzag. And I was like, what? And he said, yeah, because if a ghost is chasing you, when you hit that turn, all the bones break, and then it has to put itself back together again. <laughs> and what that taught me was even though we lost the meaning of that story, we kept that story. And so reclaiming and regaining those stories, even if we don't have the, even if they're incomplete, even if they're partial, but reclaiming and owning those, I think, is, is a big part of the way we keep this history alive. Beautiful. All right, we have 15 minutes for questions. So please raise your hand. Lucy and Malta Fanchel and Megan Boone are here. And Lucy, why don't you start? Hi. Um, I wanted to ask a question for Akia. I, I, your words are so powerful, and I think a lot of this is being framed as kind of people discovering or not knowing. But part of what you're talking about is these communities who have known and who have had these stories and about validating that. And I'm wondering for educators, so much of how students engage in the past are through primary documents and these sources and these kind of like manifestos or manifests. But how do teachers access community knowledge in meaningful ways in the way that you have to construct this exhibit so that those stories and those are, the, the knowing is shared um, in those spaces? I think you don't get that unless you have a relationship with those communities. Um, the only reason I was able to put my exhibit together is because I spent, well, I was able to cheat a little bit, right? Because I had a 20 plus year relationship with the Mashantucket Pequot Museum because that's where I got my start as a grad student and as an archeologist. But I think for us as scholars to think we can just go in and get people's stories and they will trust us with their knowledge and their stories, A, they might think we'll laugh, you know, B, they might think they'll be appropriated and published and they won't be compensated, right? There are all these issues around trust when you're dealing with communities and community stories. So I think first and foremost, it has to be a real reciprocal, sustainable relationship with communities so that they entrust you with those stories. Because a lot of the stories are hidden because they're seen as, or we've been told they're heathenish, they're devilish, right? They're not Christian. And so even when you still engage in those practices or tell those stories or have those beliefs, that's how I grew up, right? You don't talk about this outside of the house. Um, and so I think building those relationships where people know that their knowledge, and I don't say beliefs, I say knowledge, right, will be validated is the first step in doing that. Oh, okay, Megan. Um, Could you stand so, up, please? Could you just describe Adi, say that again? Yeah. So are the two of you just discovering your Parmalee um, connection here tonight? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I think we, yeah. The connection just happened today. Just yeah. in that room over there. Yes. It's about an hour and 15 minutes old. Here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, and um, the second question is, are you perhaps working on a children's book? I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't hear book? Are any of you working on a children's book about any of this? Oh, a children's book. Well, there have been children's books written, some very fine ones. I'm, are you, the Venture Smith. Yeah, saying, The Venture oh, Smith by Elizabeth. I, I mean, yeah. Elizabeth Norman, the, mm, the yeah. founding publisher of uh, Connecticut Explored, wrote an excellent children's book about Venture Smith, who is, was an enslaved man in Connecticut. Highly recommend it. Really, really good. So I would, I would check that one out. I'm happy to share that information with you. Thank you. But yeah. Okay, we're, we're going to take another you. question now. I'm sorry, did you want to? Well, I was just, I didn't, when she asked about a book being written, I, I'm writing, a, oh, <laughs> the I'm process sorry, of writing ahead. a book on Candace. Oh, for go children. for it. But it's, it's a, it, that's what I was saying, how in the world would she know that? <laughs> it's, all, it's, all, it's only got like a couple of chapters and I, you know, I euphemistically say I'm, you know, it's, but it's, a, but it, it, we oh, need great. that. We don't have, know that. there is no female, northern female tale of, of slavery. And I thought, well, I've got all of this information. I have far more than uh, the gentleman who wrote Roots had 
in terms of the generational history and because of where Candace is, what she did, how she passed her property on and how it connects to the rest of my family, it just seemed like a natural tail. Oh, so that's we, great. Yeah, we'll be, we'll be watching for that, for sure. Uh, I think we have time for at least one more. I'm sorry, go, yes. It's deeply gratifying for me to hear my alma mater mentioned Brown University as well. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Um, because um, it was Ruth, it was Ruth Simmons, President Ruth Simmons, um, who, uh, when I started college over 40 years ago, mm -hmm. the stories about Brown's history and involvement in the slave trade was well known and talked about, but it was Ruth Simmons who made it official and created an institute to study. Mm -hmm. Here, here. Good. I'm, I'm from Hartford, from Connecticut. I grew up here. And it's only been for the past 10 years that I have been researching and finding out about Brown's, uh, uh, Connecticut's history in the slave trade and slavery. But then there was the 50 years before that, and I knew nothing about it because mm -hmm. I grew up here. Mm -hmm. As I've been exploring and researching, I'm still kind of confused, especially by the term hidden histories, because I can't seem to, I'm, I'm still trying to figure this out. Um, are we talking about nonfiction, or are we talking about fiction? Well, and either way, when we're talking about the histories and, and, and reclaiming and restoring them, um, what can we do to ensure that the histories are really focused on us, as opposed to someone borrowing? And, and I, I think about, um, so many stories, you know, movies and other things, where it's not about us, mm -hmm. where we aren't the protagonist in our own stories, where the stories are, we're, we're background and supporting cast. Mm -hmm. um, what can we do to, or are we moving toward making the stories about the, the protagonist really about them? Mm -hmm. Well, for me, you, you write your own. <laughs> right. And, yeah. and, you know, the, the, right. Our, our stories have always been through the prism of what the, what the white man would publish. You know, I mean, frankly, m when you look back in, in English literature, I mean, in, in, in literature or in black writing, so often it's not what was written, it's what was published. And so it's always been distorted. So I feel very strongly we we write our own. That doesn't mean that I'm suggesting that other people shouldn't be involved in this process, because not only should they be, they have to be. We, you know, we, th this history belongs to all of us. But I think that when you recognize that there, there is a voice and it has been absent, mm -hmm. and when we highlight that voice so that it can be heard and recognized, then you begin, then th when you see something that's written in the way you're talking about, where we're in the background, it's about us, but somehow it's about the white man we were working for. When you run into that sort of thing, you, you, re you, you, you recognize the absence and you crave for an authentic telling of a story. But I'm walking a thin line because I'm not one of those people that believe that these stories can only be told by the people that own them. I believe that we all have to, you know, that, that there's a part of America accepting, believing, understanding, and living and owning all of these stories, and that's all of us. But I, you know. Well, I want to give you a, you know, a, a simple historian's answer. Um, one of the central aims of the study of black history from slavery through civil rights and beyond for 60 years, 70 years now, has been to bring the voices and the agency of black people to the heart of black history. That's what black history has been for a long time. Now, I say that on behalf of scholars, but again, it's the point. I mean, the distance between what historians write hundreds, thousands of books, and what gets into a museum, or what gets into movies. Don't even talk to me about movies. <laughs> I'm working with people to make a major movie for Netflix on Frederick Douglass. 
and the script is horrible for very, the very reasons you're suggesting, because Hollywood still has to have formulas. It's just disgusting. They have to have, they have, to have a love affair, and they need a little violence, <laughs> uh, yada, yada, yada. But, but let's, not, let's not sit here, folks, in 2024 and say this history hasn't been written. Because it has. Um, it doesn't mean it has turtled up or turtled down or turtled sideways to all the right people yet. And, and the, the power of exhibitions and museums on these stories is still relatively recent. Uh, the, the great African American Museum in Washington is not 10 years old yet although there have been other museums doing these exhibitions for quite some time, but it's all been within our lifetime. But when I see the word hidden history, when I, someone commented on that word, I see it as hidden because it has been excluded and left out. That's, that's, that it, it's concept, been, you know, it may I, have been there, yeah. and scholars may have been able to dig it out, and some people may have been interested in reading it, but there was a, there's a, there was a large movement uh. to ex push it under, exclude oh, it, right. and count it as unimportant, and, and that, that's that why was, it's hidden. That was the yeah. vision. Of Actually, there, there, we, we stopped counting. There are 50, 60 histories of Yale. Mm -hmm. And my colleague at the, at the Beinecke Library used to love to put them all on one stack. <laughs> and and we, we would make presentations, and we'd say, you know, these three mentioned slavery. <laughs> the other 47 didn't. So you're right at the same time. <laughs> There are all these histories. Of, they start writing histories of Yale in the middle of the 18th century. And you look almost in vain to even know this existed. Once in a while, it's there, but very often Or when you there. see it, it's so nostalgic, right? Oh, that, yeah. that was my upbringing in Newport. It's this person was the servant oh, of, we were talking about yeah. it um, before Newport this started. Newport story, it had the same, right? it, it has these stories about servitude yeah. Yeah. that yeah. make you feel like these people were beloved family members, right? And, and that you, there's this, uh, I think George Mason Champlin wrote a chapter about the last colored undertaker in Newport. <laughs> and the thing that amazes me about the book is he talks about how awful slavery was. Yeah. But then in the next paragraph, he's like, yeah. but since when have white and black commingled tears at funerals and, like, slavery was bad, but race relations were better under slavery. Like, that's actually what he's saying. So there's this whole nostalgia. Yeah. And when you look at cemeteries, it doesn't say slave, it says servant. And so we tend to, and I know Newport is just getting out of this, but the people that are, the, the people that are most um, referenced when we talk about slavery in Newport are stories that make white people feel good about slavery being in Newport. Because these people were beloved and they were talented and, they, and when they were freed, they stayed with the families because they loved them so much, right? So I think that's another way of hiding the story. Oh, You're yeah. totally stripping, stripping people of their humanity yeah. by telling this nostalgic story that ignores the brutality of their existence as enslaved people. People like happy history. Yeah. Happy but history. I mean, that's what you're fighting happy about. History. Yeah. They're they're happy history. They like happy history. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> we have to stop here yeah. um, because I've been told we have to stop. <laughs> um, I want to thank you all for coming. Let's do a I, double header next yeah. week. I, 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 I hope this is just the beginning. So thank you all. Thank you.